Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry video covers knowing when the substitution mechanism is SN1 or SN2. Before we get started with addressing that question, we'll want to take a look at the mechanisms and summarize all of the important details. In this table, we're going to go through some of those. On the top, I've got property, how it relates to SN1, how it relates to SN2, and then the various important factors. First, we'll take a look at the substitution of the substrate alkyl halide, Rx. In the SN1 mechanism, the order of reactivity is tertiary is more reactive than secondary, which is so much more reactive than primary and methyl that these substrates usually don't react. The important thing here is that carbocation stability is the key factor. Tertiary carbocations are much more stable than secondary, which are much more stable than primary and methyl. For SN2 reaction, substitution also matters, but for different reasons. In these reactions, methyl halides are the most reactive, followed by primary, followed by secondary, and tertiary don't react. In this case, it's all about steric hindrance. Steric hindrance of the nucleophile is the key factor. Next, we'll take a look at leaving group. It turns out that both SN1 and SN2 require a good leaving group because the leaving group leaves in the rate determining step. So this isn't something that you can use to distinguish mechanisms. They both require a good leaving group. Next, we'll take a look at nucleophile. In the SN1 mechanism, weak nucleophiles react okay. In fact, in SN1 mechanisms, the nucleophile is often weak, and the reason for that is that conditions that support carbocations usually also require weak nucleophiles. For the SN2 reaction, the situation is different. A strong nucleophile is needed because it attacks in the rate determining step. Next, we'll look at solvent. The SN1 reaction is favored by polar protic solvents. The reason for this is that strong solvation of the polar intermediates, the carbocation, speeds up the SN1 reaction because it stabilizes those intermediates. For SN2, strong solvation is a liability. SN2 reactions are favored by polar aprotic solvents because they solvate the nucleophile much more weakly. Here, strong solvation of the nucleophile slows down the SN2 reaction. This is a table that would be a good idea to memorize. There's just so much useful information here that you'll need to know this to keep the reaction mechanism straight when you're working problems. On the next slide, we'll take a look at a couple of other properties that are important in SN1 and SN2 mechanisms. First, we'll look at the rate. For the SN1 mechanism, the rate depends only on the concentration of the alkyl halide, Rx. For the SN2 reaction, the rate depends on both the concentrations of the alkyl halide, Rx, and the nucleophile. For number of steps, the SN1 mechanism is two steps, and the first step is rate limiting. For the SN2 mechanism, it's one step, and that's called a concerted reaction. The final property we'll take a look at is stereochemistry. In the SN1 mechanism, mixtures of stereoisomers result. You'll get inversion and retention products when the reaction occurs at a stereogenic center. In an SN2 reaction, complete inversion occurs. We call those reactions stereoselective. On this next slide, we'll answer the question, when is the mechanism SN1 or SN2? Based on the information in the previous two slides, the first thing you should do is look at the substitution of the alkyl halide substrate. It's easy to do, and it oftentimes tells you what you need to know right away. SN1 usually occurs with secondary and tertiary substrates. SN2 usually occurs with methyl, primary, or secondary substrates. Looking at the alkyl halide is often enough to predict what the mechanism will be. One issue, though, is you'll notice that secondary alkyl halides are listed as possibilities in both SN1 and SN2 mechanisms. Therefore, in cases where you have secondary alkyl halide substrates, you need to look a little further. In these cases, for secondary substrates, look at the nucleophile component. That's the other component besides the alkyl halide. SN1 mechanisms are favored by weak nucleophiles, while SN2 reactions are favored by strong nucleophiles. You can think of it like this. In the SN2 reaction, the alkyl halide is actively attacked by a strong nucleophile. In the SN1 mechanism, weak nucleophiles are not nearly as aggressive, and they won't react with something as unreactive as a neutral alkyl halide. They need a carbocation to react with. Once a carbocation forms, a weak nucleophile will attack it, but only when there's a carbocation. Let's take a look at an example of this where we have an alkyl halide substrate that could undergo either reaction. In this case, we have an alkyl chloride substrate. It happens to be a secondary alkyl halide, and there's two reaction conditions. On the left is methanol. This is a weak nucleophile. You can tell because the oxygen is neutral. Neutral oxygen nucleophiles are weak. Therefore, this will undergo reaction by SN1 mechanism. 
The SN1 mechanism's characteristics are that it gives mixtures of stereoisomers. So we're gonna get, in this case, a retention product on the left and an inversion product on the right. Additionally, there's an acid-base product shown here. On the reaction to the right, the nucleophile is strong. You could tell because the oxygen here is negatively charged. Negatively charged oxygen nucleophiles tend to be strong. The strong nucleophile will promote the SN2 substitution mechanism. That'll give this product, which is a complete inversion product. Additionally, there's also the salt product. And that's a good summary of how you determine whether the mechanism goes by SN1 or SN2. And this is something that you should do when you're tackling a substitution problem. Before you attempt to start drawing products, make sure you know what mechanism is active.